Um, I know that some people are still coming in the room, but it's one minute past four, so I just wanted to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I'm Danielle Higa. I'm the Fund Development Manager here at Densho, and um, I just wanted to welcome everybody to the Densho Sake School with Sake School of America. Um, we're really excited to kick off this pre-party uh, for the Densho Dinner event and um, appreciate everybody for spending their afternoon with us. So for today, we have really special guests and a big treat for this afternoon. Um, for your happy hour, uh, we have Ida Vong and Toshio Ueno here, um, and they will help us get smarter about our beloved sake. And then after the presentation, there will, there will be a Q&A. Um, so please feel free to utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and submit your questions. And so I'm just gonna hand it over to Ida and please take it away. Hi, everybody. Let me just get my screen shared here. All right. Um, okay, welcome. So my name is Ida Vong. I am a sake specialist. Um, I work for uh, Mutual Trading in Los Angeles. I also do help out with the Sake School of America. So welcome. I call this Sips of Knowledge. <laughs> But basically, I know a lot of you have seen sake around town. Um, these are a couple bottles you might recognize, including maybe the ones that you might have purchased today um, to do the tasting portion with us. So there's all kinds of sake out there. It's not just all sake bombs and hot sake. So if you've had a bad experience with sake, it was most likely just not prepared the right way, or um, you just had some lower quality sake. But let's talk about what kind of goes into sake. So what exactly is sake though? Well, sake is a Japanese alcohol beverage brewed from fermented rice. And you can see there's the rice um, in its regular plant form and then Next to it, we have the polished rice that's been steamed. And that fuzzy rice is actually called uh, rice koji, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. And then all that rice is dumped in with water and a couple other things to kind of ferment. So let's talk about what the ingredients in sake are. So first of all, we have steamed rice, which provides the starch. We also have rice koji. Again, we'll be talking that, about that a little bit later. Um, but that provides the enzyme needed to break down the large starches in rice to create sugar. And then we also have water. And water plays a big role in creating sake. Um, there's a lot of soft water, a lot of hard water, but mostly it's soft water used to create sake. That gives it a really like kind of clean, soft texture and flavor. But there are places that do use slightly harder or more, more um, water with more minerals in it. So I'm sure you've been around um, different states before and if you've ever drank like the tap water, it all tastes kind of different. And we also have yeast, which creates the alcohol we like and a little bit of carbon dioxide and heat. So a little bit about the sake rice. It's actually a special type of rice. So it's called shizo ko tekimai. It's quite a mouthful but that's basically what sake rice is. It's specially cultivated. So you'll see it on the left side, there's a kind of white fluffy concentrated area in the middle that's called the shimpaku or like white core, white heart. This is just a concentration of starch um, and it kind of just better feeds the yeast as well as makes it a lot easier for koji to kind of propagate onto rice. And on the right side, we have rice that is just for eating, like regular table rice. So rice that you have every day. Um, I heard that you can eat table rice, or I mean, sorry, sake rice, but it's not exactly tasty. So I would probably stick to the rice that you usually eat. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about koji. So koji is actually a fungus. Um, it sounds really unappealing, but a lot of the foods we eat are produced with microorganisms like yogurt, right? So koji is a fungus that um, is used in making things like soy sauce, miso, sake. And what is the difference between koji and rice koji? It's really a matter of semantics. So koji is the actual fungus 
and then rice koji is koji that's been propagated and onto rice. So it's like the fuzzy rice that you see there. And why is koji so important? Again, it creates the enzyme needed to break down like these complex sugars, the carbohydrates and starches into smaller, more um, palatable pieces of sugar for the yeast to eat and then digest and then create sake with. So there are actually three types of koji. Uh, there's yellow, black, and white. What we usually use for sake is yellow koji, and that's also the same koji used for making soy sauce, miso, and sake. Um, black koji and white koji have their own uses. They can be used in sake, but it's kind of more rare. Uh, a lot of the time it's used in shochu and other things. And if you've ever been to a Japanese supermarket, sometimes they have something called shio, shio koji, which is rice koji, but with salt added. And it's great if you use it to kind of tenderize meats uh, or marinate meats in it. It'll make it a lot softer and it kind of absorbs more of whatever flavors you're adding to it. And creating koji is a round the clock watch kind of thing. It takes a really long time, like about 48 hours to fully um, propagate and create the koji. And you pretty much just have these people in this really hot room holding their breath and like sprinkling the koji onto the rice. Um, but it is a very sensitive kind of process. And so they need to watch over it for 48 hours. Moving on to the fermentation method. So the unique fermentation method um, is actually called multiple parallel fermentation. And I believe this is only used in sake. Uh, so you start off with this giant tank, right? Filled with water. You have your rice and the starch, the koji that penetrate and break down that starch into smaller pieces of sugar that the yeast and then come in, eat that up, and then poop out alcohol, basically. <laughs> so um, this is pretty much called multiple parallel fermentation. Everything goes in at once, um, even though they might be created separately first, but everything goes in together at the same time, and then it is it all just happens together at the same time, well, compared to other fermentation methods where it's kind of like a line process, like you have, you know, um, kind of creating the malt and beer, and then there's another process or step after that, and then they kind of do things separately instead of all together. And getting to know sake. So I know a lot of you might not have a lot of experience with sake, so some things you might want to kind of look out for that might help you pick out sake or understand sake better would be the sake meter value. So the sake meter value is a general indicator of sweetness and dryness. Um, it's not the end all be all, but it definitely does help you figure out what is sweet and what is a little bit drier. Now this picture only goes up to five, but it can go even higher sometimes for certain sake like 15 or 20. So some things I like to kind of use to help me remember what is what is the higher the drier or low on the meter, it's sweeter. And other things you might want to consider are the semi buai or rice polish ratio, the grade of the sake, sokujo versus kimotoke, and the sake region. So these are all things that kind of can help you figure out what you're looking for in a sake and then be able to identify it later on and then you know kind of figure out whether or not you're going to like that sake or not. So let's talk about semi buai. That's the rice polishing ratio. You'll probably usually hear it referred to that as the rice polishing ratio um, and this kind of helps determine the sake grades but it also plays a important part uh, in cost and also kind of like the flavor outcome or aroma outcome as well. So as you can see, um, all the way on the left, we have 70% of the rice kernel remaining. So the rice polishing ratio you'll always see is the percent of the kernel remaining. So if it's 70% remaining, that means 30% has been polished off and then so on and so forth as you see as it moves down the line. 
So let's talk about the sake grades as well. So the sake grades, it usually is kind of shown as a pyramid, but I feel like that kind of makes it sound like one is better than the other. So I've just put it in a chart here. So it's usually called the tokute mei shoshu. So you have two different kinds of classes first. You have the junmai type, which translates into pure rice. And then you also have the aruten or honjozo type, which basically it means that it's been fortified with uh, brewer's alcohol or like a high strength alcohol. Um, there are different reasons for doing that. You could definitely lighten up a sake that might be too heavy. It also does help certain aromas uh, come out a little more. And also again, makes things a little bit drier, or crisper, because you are adding more alcohol. So let's talk about daiginjo. So if it has junmai attached to it, it's of course not gonna have any alcohol added to it. And then if it's just daiginjo, then that means it's had brewer's alcohol added to it. Um, so again, like the flavor will be a little bit lighter. But with daiginjos, you usually get this really great fruity floral aroma. Um, that is because 50% of the rice has been polished away and 50% is of the kernel is remaining. So you get more of that concentrated starch on the inside that we saw earlier. And that is really what the yeast likes. Um, and that kind of ends up with uh, just a more kind of elegant and kind of classic, gorgeous type of uh, sake. And the next class we have ginjo or junmai ginjo. So this is a 60% or less of the kernel remaining. Basically, it still has a little bit uh, more rice than the daiginjo. And so you get a little bit more of like the ricier notes, but you still also get that fruity floral kind of like lightness to it. But it's a great kind of in between, between um, what we're gonna see at that 70% rate all the way at the bottom. And there's also something called ginjo ka. It kind of applies to both ginjo and daiginjos, but it's basically translates to ginjo aroma. So those are the kind of aromas and smells that you get from like these type of sake. It's a lot like fruity, floral, very beautiful scents. And then we also have this strange class called Tokubetsu Junmai and Tokubetsu Honjozo. So again, Junmai is the pure rice type, so no alcohol is added to it. And then the Honjozo type has brewer's alcohol added to it, right? It's been fortified. So Tokubetsu basically translates to special. Uh, what is special? It really depends. There's no kind of like regulations on this, but basically it is a higher polish ratio. So at, at least about 60% or less. Um, you'll see later on that one of the sake we're tasting is a Tokubetsu Honjozo that has a 55% polish ratio, I believe. So that's probably why they call it Tokubetsu Honjozo. There also could have been just extra care, um, kind of like they watched over that batch uh, a little bit more carefully, or it's been brewed with special ingredients. So it really depends. But I think tokubetsu sake are really great because they give you a lot of value for what you're paying for. They're usually really great sake at really great prices. And then finally, we have just the junmai or the honjozo type, um, which means that it's 70% or less of the kernels remaining. Um, that's a kind of guideline for junmais. I believe they don't actually have a actual rule for the junmais to have a, a specific polish ratio, but honjo do, honjozo does need to be at least 70% or less. And then not part of the tokute mei shoshu is something called futsushu, which just means regular, like regular alcohol or regular sake. So that has a lot more alcohol added to it. Um, and then let's talk about lactic acid in sake. So why do you need lactic acid in sake? It actually helps protect the yeast from all these like invaders um, and like bad bacteria and things like that. So they're just kind of like bodyguards, but they also do end up influencing the flavor. 
So there's actually two styles. We have the Sokujo style, which we'll talk about first. It is the modern and super fast way of creating the kind of fermentation starter um, where the yeast can kind of propagate and things like that. So the Sokujo style, it's made um, by kind of like more modern technology where we can create this lactic acid and distribute it commercially. It's commercially available, they buy it, it's liquid. Um, and it takes about two weeks for the starter to um, be made with the Sokujo style. And it tends to create very elegant and clean sake. And it's used in 90%, 90% of all sake produced. So while you might not see the bottle say Sokujo style, um, you can just pretty much guess and assume that it's a Sokujo style sake. So it's gonna be relatively elegant and clean, but we also have another style of lactic acid, which is called Kimoto K. Um, Kimoto K is kind of where, it's a lot more traditional. So it's traditional and time consuming. It takes about double the time that Sokujo does. It's about four weeks to make the fermentation starter. So very slow. And during that time, um, a lot of other things kind of happen. So it becomes a very bold, earthy, and funky sake. And you'll usually see on uh, the sake label, either Kimoto or Yamahai. So those kind of denote that they've taken the time to create this lactic acid from scratch. And um, the two types, Kimoto basically means there's this whole ore mashing process to kind of like help speed up uh, the kind of like breaking down of sugars and things like that. And you can see that happening on the left picture. And then Yamahai just means they don't have that whole ore mashing process, but it's pretty much similar um, otherwise. And next we have serving temperatures. So for serving temperatures, it's there's a whole range. There's a whole range. And um, we have a handout which we will be um, emailing out tomorrow, I believe. So don't, don't worry, you don't have to take too many notes, but it's a very, you can have sake that's been, that's been chilled, so very cold, or you can also heat it up. So for chilled sake, it's of course a lot more refreshing. It kind of helps enhance the brisk and crisp qualities of sake. And it does kind of suppress the aroma sometimes um, and emphasize the bitterness of sake. Just depends, just don't make it too cold and it, you should be fine. But serving temperature should never fall below five degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So you just don't want to over chill it. So it keeps the flavor and the aroma. We also have hot sake. So it's either the really dreaded hot sake or the really liked hot sake. But there are a couple pros to this. So it definitely enhances the aroma and flavor of sake. It helps certain things like chemically open up more. It can also induce a flavor that's a lot more mellow and comforting. You know, like when on cold days you want something warmer, it just tends to be a little more comforting as well. And the heat does emphasize the sharp edge of alcohol to yield like a more dry finish. So this is kind of like a half pro, half con. Just depends on whether you like that or not. And for the con, it can definitely destroy delicate flavors and aroma nuances of more refined sake. So what sake should you be heating up or can heat up? Uh, we definitely recommend Junmai, Kimoto, or Yamahai types. And again, this will be in the handout that you receive. And there's also Honjozo and again, Futsushu types, which are a little bit better um, heated up to a higher temperature. Now, we don't usually recommend that you heat up Junmai Ginjos or Junmai Dai Ginjos. Those are things that just as a rule of thumb are better chilled and shouldn't be heated up. You can definitely experiment. We welcome you to do that. And how to heat sake. Please use a hot water bath and heat it up slowly. So don't use water that's too hot. And please don't microwave your <laughs> sake because this will heat it up way too quickly it'll kind of just cause unpleasant smells and the alcohol will just be really apparent. So stop, please, <laughs> stop. 
And we're getting into the last area here. So there are different regions of Japan. If you've ever visited, you would definitely know there are different prefectures um, and areas of Japan. So we have Niigata sake today. All the sake that um, is recommended that you guys uh, buy for the tasting today are from Niigata. And Niigata is known for cultivating gohyaku mangoku rice. And um, that kind of ends up in a lot of the sake that they produ produce in Niigata, which is also known for their um, tanle karakuchi, which tends to be a kind of refite line, light and dry kind of uh, finish and feel. So a lot of gohyaku mangoku rice kind of produces that kind of sake as well. And it's a snow-based terroir or kind of like environment that the sake is created in. So there's a lot of snowfall there and that kind of helps create um, snow melt water that's very pristine and pure. And then it also acts as like a natural air filter. And Niigata is also home to Echigo Toji or a group of brewmasters. They are one of the largest and one of the most influential and skillful group of sake masters in Japan. And they tend to have like a certain style. So you'll, you'll, once you get into that whole rabbit hole, you'll start to kind of connect the dots and see how things um, match up. But let's get into the first sake, which is from Kikusui. It's Kikusui Junmai Ginjo, and I'm going to hand it over to Eno-san to do the tasting portion. What a great presentation by Ida-san. I'm so proud. Here's a Kikusui Jinmai Ginjo from Niigata. This is, you know, she mentioned about the grading system uh, from the top, Jinmai Dai Ginjo, Jinmai Ginjo. So this, this is a uh, you know, second here from the top. So this one is 55% polish ratio. So it's not so much, but uh, it is uh, kind of higher polishing ratio once. Uh, SMB is a sake meter body, which is a density of sake against density of water. But basically, it's, you put the hydrometer in, if it floats up, it means the sake has a lot of sugar, so it becomes a minus measure. But if it doesn't have a, the liquid sake itself, doesn't have a sugar, goes down and gives you a plus measure. Usually, uh, plus, above plus eight is a drier sake. And you can you can see uh, the highest one in the United States will be plus 15. And the sweeter one uh, is uh, minus 15 to minus 20, usually average wise. You know, those milky sake, nigori sake is a sweeter ones. But anyway, let's taste uh, my ginjo from Kiksui. And this one, you know, uh, this is the most popular Junmai Ginjo sake in USA. Uh, why we know? Because we are the importer and we are the largest importer of sake in the United States. And this is a number one selling sake for us. And the reason why is that, is that it's so popular is that uh, it has a really nice uh, rice flavor and also at the same time it has red rice and really nice citrus uh, aroma too. Let's have a smell. And uh, Ida san is going to give you uh, the guide tomorrow, tomorrow and you will see the tasting notes how you are supposed to uh, assess the sake or you know. But anyway, uh, yeah this has a really nice uh, yellow apple, uh, orange zest, and at the same time, this has a really uh, gr grain uh, aroma, like uh, rice, steamed rice, and cereals, and a little bit of lactic acid. Let's have a taste. This is plus two, but I feel a little bit more drier. I think acid level is a little bit higher, but it's really nice light uh, entrance, very clean, but you have a umami at the same time. You know, if you go a higher Polish one like Daikinjo and Ginjo, you don't have so much uh, umami or amino acid in, but this one has, that's the reason why this goes well with so many food and she recommended 
uh, some of the food in your guidebook for the tomorrow. This can go with so many food, even some meat like uh, chicken and pork. Okay, that's Junmai Ginju from Kiksui. And next one is Kubota. This is a Junmai Dai Ginjo, and the rice is Gohaku Mangoku, 50% portion ratio. Yes, someone said, Tom san said, it. this tastes great. Yeah, it's good. And uh, Junmai Dai Ginjo means what? Uh, it has to be a uh, the Polish ratio has to be less than 50%. Uh, so this is uh, SM sake meter value is plus minus zero. So it's it's in the middle and alcohol is 15%. You know, you've seen a lot of Kubota in the market. This one is a little bit of modern type. Uh, if you see uh, Manju, Senju, these, those are the classic type. These are the a little bit more than that. And this one has really nice fruity floral aroma. I can smell uh, also tropical fruits too. You can smell, I can smell pineapple, melons, bananas, lychee, and also the stone fruits uh, uh, categories. I can smell Asian pear, Japanese pear, nashi in this one. Very nice. And you know, other kubota is more restrained or subdued on aroma. This one is modern type, so it gives you lots of tropical fruits notes and also lots of, maybe a little bit of flower notes too, like uh, acacia and honey, honeysuckle flowers. Let's, yeah. Wow. Very smooth, soft, and uh, this one is kind of dangerous. You can drink it, this one, I mean, <laughs> forever. <laughs> it's like, you know, so smooth and clean and uh, yeah, and very nice and fruity. And yeah, this is Kubota from Niigata too. Also, we are tasting all the all, uh, Niigata sake as Ida-san mentioned. And so the first one is a more classic uh, Niigata type. This one is more modern, but then we have number three sake, which is another very renowned, famous maker from Niigata is Hakkai-san. This one is making uh, with a uh, gohaku mongo rice and some local rice, todoroki wase. And Polish ratio is 55, SMB is plus four, and ABP is 15.5. So remember uh, when Ida-san mentioned about Junmai, this is not Junmai. This is Honjozo, so it's fortified. Fortified means adding alcohol into the mash, sake mash, still uh, not, it's cloudy, uh, the cloudy mash in the tank. And you add alcohol and the insoluble flavor and also aroma will be, become a soluble because the higher, uh, highly distilled spirits become a solvent. And it will take out the good aroma and good, uh, good uh, flavor from the mash. So, and also make the sake a little bit drier and lighter. And by the way, this is most most sold, most popular honjozo sake in Japan. If you go to sushi restaurant, you see a lot of hakkai san honjozo. The reason why is this. You see the difference between one, two, especially in two and this one. Aloma is not pronounced as number two. This one is much, much restrained and more savvy on aloma. And the why? It's good because it doesn't it doesn't offend or it doesn't overpower the you know the, the delicate food of Japanese food. So many chefs prefers non dai ginjo, especially as a sushi chef likes this one. And uh, this one has much, much wider range of food pairing. And you see that. So smell, you smell more uh, rice grain itself, like brown rice, maybe a little bit uh, a mochi or uh, steamed rice, and a little bit lactic notes. And also nuts, like uh, walnuts, chestnut, and also a little bit of flour in there too, white flour, very nice. And maybe a little bit of uh, yellow apple. Let's have a taste. 
A little bit more wider, broader uh, on the on, on your palate, but it's much drier. You feel the dryness when you swallow it, or you when you spit it out, the dryness comes out. That's what this is supposed to do, and also this one gives you more umami, savoriness or deliciousness. So this one, that's at least another reason why this goes well with so many uh, food, and. Uh, this is food friendly, very food friendly uh, sake, and also the more, very popular in Japan. And I think you can taste this one with even with cheese, pizza, cheeseburger, and some of that, that uh, you know Italian dish, and also uh, Italian dish meaning it has a lot of tomato sauce and cheese. Romano cheese goes well with this, and you know tomato itself has umami too, tomato sauce itself and some shellfish, uh, oyster, uh, lobster, crab meat. God, those, those, those would be great. So you're in the, you know, the good region to have a seafood, try with sake. I think the best thing with like crab meat, oyster, and shellfish, all shellfish family should be drunk with sake. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, ita -san. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ueno-san. Um, I just wanted to really quickly uh, give you a few, few fun facts um, before I hand it back over to Danielle. Um, so for the Kuboto Jumai Dai Ginjo, that one was actually created for their 30 year anniversary. And um, it was actually made for a limited time, but it was so popular that they decided to bring it back. Um, yeah, come here, come here. That's done. Come on! And, um, what? Somebody, yeah, somebody. How is this one? Start video? Mm. Oh dear, okay. Well, okay. anyways, um, like Wano san said, sake does go well with a whole bunch of different kinds of foods. So, one thing I like to say is, what does this sake make you hungry for? And most likely it'll pair well with whatever it makes you hungry for. All right. Thank you. I'm going to hand this back over to Danielle. Thanks so much, Ida san and Uano san. That was so informative. I was busy taking notes, so sorry. It took me a while to come back. Um, yeah, so it looks like we have a couple of questions um, in the Q&A um, in regards to how long do bottles last of uh, after opening, and I know Ida san, you, mess, you mentioned that uh, these bottles will last up to a week. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so it's really just all about the oxidization. Um, it really kind of changes and damages sake, which is why most sake is in darker bottles um, to kind of protect it from light. But uh, pretty much s smaller bottles, you have kind of less to work with. Like bigger bottles will last longer if you open them, but uh, smaller bottles, there's just, it, they kind of change a lot faster. And I would say it would definitely last about a week or so for those, the 300 milliliter ones. Um, but you shouldn't really notice too much of a change. The bitterness will kind of increase over time, um, especially for more delicate sake, like the Daiginjos and Jumai Daiginjos. So I would be careful with that. But if you get like a bigger, like a 720 milliliter bottle, like the Hakkai San one, compared to this little 300 oh, that's milliliter helpful. size. Yeah, it'll last a lot longer, um, maybe like two weeks or so. Uh, professionally, we like to say, drink it as soon as possible, don't wait too long. But it can last a lot longer than you think. Um, and some people actually like like the flavor when it changes. So it really just depends. I hope that kind of answers the question. But. Yeah, that's really helpful because I think all of us hesitate mm -hmm. to open a bottle and then we leave it in the, you know, in the fridge or whatnot and use it for cooking, but it's good to have some professional guidance. Yeah, and it's also, again, it's great for cooking. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. <laughs> yeah, um, another, Great question. Um, 
is how is the wet rice polished? Um, I think Uno-san, do you want to answer that one? I think he's better at answering that than I am. So, you know, it's, it's, there is a, you know, uh, the machine and there's a hopper, hopper holds the rice. It's a, the, the machine, uh, the height is like 20 feet and hopper is like 50, 15 feet and you have a spinning stone inside. And when the rice comes down and hit the spinning stone, by nick by nick, it will take that, that, that brown part out and it go back to the hopper again. And this goes, goes back and, and comes down to the, the spinning stone for so many times. It takes like, you know, 50 hours to polish it down to 50%. So it takes a long, long time to polish it down to uh, Daiginjo grade. The reason why is that, that it takes time because the friction will create the heat heat is not good. So heat will crack the rice or heat, heat might damage the rice. So that's the, the reason why it takes such a long time. So very slow process. Oh, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Caitlin from the Den Show team asks, uh, if we need to refrigerate bottles after opening them. Uh, yes, we highly recommend you refrigerate the bottles after opening. Um, also before opening, we, re we recommend you keep them just like refrigerated so it keeps the quality a little bit better. It's just all about quality control. Um, and it's most, it's less likely to damage your sake that way. Um, so keep it chilled. And if you want to warm it up, again, use the hot water bath. <laughs> keep key point of advice, <laughs> hot water bath. Um, Carol says she makes takuan with sake and she's curious which kind would be best for recipes. What kind of sake would be good for making takuan pickles? I, I think it just depends on what kind of like flavor you want to impart, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't really want to use anything too like polished just because those tend to kind of bitter a little bit more. Um, and they're a little bit fruity and more floral. So if you want that, maybe you can add it in, but I think I would just go with butsushu or like a Jumai or Honjozo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Less polished. Less polished. Less polished. Carol, less polished. <laughs> um, Aaron asks, is there a reason that sake is traditionally drunk in such small cups when ultimately a lot is drunk? <laughs> uh, it's, you know, supposed to, uh, you know, uh, pour each other. You know, in Japanese culture, you know, you pour each other, right? You don't let your uh, friend pour by, by themselves. So it's, you know, it's, and also keep it fresh. You know, if it's a smaller cup, you, you know, it's a fresh inside, right? So if you want and you get another fresh one, but if it's a bigger bowl, it stays there for a long time, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's not fun. I mean, it's, it's fun that, that you pour each other and talk to each other. It's, it's part of communication, you know. And then, uh, as you know, I think some, you, maybe you're a uh, uh, Japanese descent, so you know, you're supposed to take care of your friends. Mm -hmm. So don't let your friend pour by, some, by, by himself. So it's, you'll pour them. And, but but, but sometimes they, some people ask me, what happens if you want to drink more? So that time you pour to him and he might realize, oh, he might, your uh, cups are empty too. So he might pour to you. Oh, yeah. How you, 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 you're supposed to do in the Japanese community, I mean, uh, culture. But, you know, that, uh, and also uh, hot sake, right? When you want the sake, when you put this one of these big uh, glasses, it's going to, the, the, the temperature is going to decrease really quickly. But if you have a smaller cup, it stay warm. That makes sense. Thank you. Just just to add on to that, though, yeah. uh, we usually do recommend that you drink them in like a wine glass, a white wine glass, maybe. Um, we have these special like tasting glasses um, that are a little bit taller, but it just kind of helps you concentrate the aroma. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's especially, especially like ginjo and daiginjo type. I highly recommend uh, the wine glasses especially white wine glasses. It's the same thing. Why, why when you're not using red, you know, like Bordeaux grass or Bangadi, Burgundy, red, bigger bowl, it's the same thing. Mm. If, you know, the Junmai Dan Ginjo Ginjo is supposed to be chill, right? Correct, Daniel? 
So when you pour to bigger bowl, the temperature goes up really quickly. That's why you want to have you don't want to use red wine grasses, and instead uh, this smaller type of white wine grass is better. Okay. Good to know. And also, Uano-san, I was noticing your tasting technique. You kind of swirled it around a little bit. Can you t can you talk to the audience more about your your tasting technique? Yeah, and um, you know, the back then when when we didn't have a polishing machine and when we didn't have daiginjo and ginjo type, ginjo daiginjo type is a very new thing. It's like only like seventy years old because we didn't have a polishing machine to push the rice down to less than sixty uh, percent or seventy percent. Before that, we are using you know water mills and uh, windmill to punching down the rice and that movement will push the rice. But now they have that machine to push down to really low and taking out all the proteins out. Proteins are not good. I mean, sometimes it's uh, too much is not good. But anyway, uh, why would I do this? Because you wanna, you wanna, there is a lots of esters. Esters, uh, it's the aroma you get. So when you swallow them, those ester will evaporate. That's why you swallow them. Uh, there is a, you know, there is no rules that you swallow inward or outward, you know, this way or this way, but as a manner, you are supposed to swallow inside because when you, when you at the party, you're standing, you swallow them and you, if you are doing outward, you spill to other people. But if you, uh, you know, swallowing inward, you're spilling to yourself. So that's, that's a, that's a manner that you're supposed to do, but this, uh, you know, will, enhance aloma more. So mm -hmm. if you don't smell anything, you swirl more. Keep swirling, keep swirling. <laughs> Sometimes we're, when we're judging a wine and sake, if you don't smell so much, we do this. <laughs> oh, really? That's yeah, so yeah, interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very lively and considerate. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a couple questions from Ron. Um, Ron says, these sake are from Niigata. Is there a style to the regions? And what is Niigata style and what are the main sake regions? Um, I'll talk a little bit about this and then hand it off to Eno-san. So yes, these sake are from Niigata. Um, there's definitely a style to different regions, I believe. Niigata style, like I said, it's um, tanle karakuchi. So it's a little bit um, dry, kind of elegant and clean. And um, I would have to say the style of a region really is based around the type of rice that they grow there, uh, as well as just kind of like whether or not they have like a guild there. Usually they do. So like I said, they have the Echigo Toji or Echigo um, Master Brewers Guild, and they have a certain style that they like to adhere to as well. There are a lot of other main sake regions in fact, you can pretty much, every like prefecture brews sake, I believe, almost every prefecture. And I, th I believe Hyogo is one, right? Hyogo? Yeah. He's nodding at me. <laughs> but Ueno-san, would you like to talk about the other main sake regions? Yeah, uh, sake region, famous ones, Hyogo, Nada region is very famous, uh, you know, Kobe regions. And their sake are a little bit more bolder and crisp. And the reason why is that, that uh, uh, Ida-san mentioned about the soft water, correct? Less minerals. But Nada region, Kobe region, uh, has a harder type of water, more uh, magnesium and calcium in the water. So that will, because of the minerals uh, eaten by those yeast and koji as, a, as they are nutrients, the, the fermentation become more vigorous. So their sake tends to be more broader, uh, more bolder, uh, more drier. And that's a, you know one of the region very famous, and another region famous one is Kyoto. Kyoto is you know our old capital of Japan, correct? So they they are very famous, and there is water uh, is much softer than uh, Kobe regions. Uh, the very famous uh, water is uh, uh, Gokosui from Shimi Kyoto. Shimi is uh, the highest production in Kyoto and they have very soft water. So soft water gives you more softer mouthfeel and a little bit more uh, quieter, much, much quieter uh, fermentation. So it gives you much, much smooth, clean taste. So that, those are the one, but you know, each region as uh, Ida san mentioned, gills, different gills. We have 25 gills uh, existing in Japan and all gills has a different technique. And you know, like I'm from Yamanashi where the 
uh, inland, we have uh, inland of Mount Fuji side, not Shizuoka side, uh, inland. And we didn't, have, you know, there is a historical uh, aspect to this one too, because uh, uh, we didn't have a highway and we didn't have a good transportation system. So our sake tends to be border because the, uh, the fish we got, because we didn't have any uh, ocean because we are on the mountainside. So the fish used to be uh, salted. So our sake has to be, you know, pair with, uh, it has to, you know, match with those saltier fish. So that's why our sake is much, much bolder and can withstand the, the saltiness. So depending on, you know, of where you are and, uh, you know, as, as you know, you know, I'm pretty sure in uh, your region, ramen noodle is very popular, correct? Ramen noodle, if you go to Hokkaido, it's miso ramen, correct? If you go to Tokyo, you have soy sauce ramen. If you go to Kyushu, you have tonkotsu ramen, which is pork based, right? So each region has a different, you know, uh, flavor preference. So uh, there is a, you know, sake has to match with those food, right? Like, let's say the, even the soy sauce, uh, Kanto region soy sauce and Kyushu is, you know, if you have been to Kyushu, Kyushu, soy sauce from Kyushu is sweet. So those flavor preference makes a sake different too, so. So interesting. And kind of related to the history and all of that in the Densho Family History Program, the food and the water and the region is really, is, is something that we can all think about too, especially Japanese Americans when we don't feel like we have a very strong connection to Japan. But now I'm going to think about the food that uh, my relatives and ancestors grew up with. <laughs> and you guys are lucky that you guys have a lot of good, good you know, uh, seafood there. And also you guys have a soft water after you take a shower here in LA, you feel like it's so dry and, you know, uh, yeah. sandy. But if you go to your, your side of the town, your, you know, after you take a shower, so nice and moist, you know, those are the soft water. You guys have a really nice soft water, so it's good. Thank you. I also just had a question about uh, you two and what your favorite sake is right now. Um, asking both of us, right? Yes. Yeah. So curious. Do you want to go first? No, uh, yeah. You know, it's, I always say this. Uh, you're asking me which, which child, which kids are your favorite kids. I cannot tell you which one is my favorite child. But, you know, I like a drier style sake than the sweeter side. Uh, that's the only things I can tell. I can, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to tell you the brand name, but yeah, yeah. But the drier sake is for me. And for me, I'm going to kind of, uh, first of all, I want to preface this with saying there's no sake that's better than another. Technically, everything is kind of all personal preference, right? Um, so that's why I like to not put the tokute ni shoshu or like the sake grades as a pyramid. Like one is not exactly like better than the other. They just all have different things to offer. Um, personally, I actually like more acidic sake. So something that Mutual Trading carries is called Senkin. That's the brewery. They have this great, um, really high acidity sake, which is like kind of juicy. So I, I personally really like that. Um, I'm also a sucker for sparkling sake because <laughs> they're just kind of fun to drink. Totally. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and one last question before we start to wrap up. Um, since we're in a time of a global pandemic, I'm curious if you can tell the audience about um, any health benefits that sake can offer. Bueno san, I believe, has got this. No? Okay. <laughs> um, there's actually a lot, a lot of people, if, okay, this is something you can do with your leftover sake if you think it's undrinkable. Um, you can definitely put it in your bath. It's really great for your skin. Um, Make sure you're not using like the, the coarse filtered one, like a nigori, use like a, a filtered kind of clear sake. And you can also buy like those dry face masks and then kind of soak it in the sake or you could use it as a toner. So sake is really, really good for your skin. And um, it's, it also doesn't kind of, it provides a little bit more energy and it 
due to like the kind of chemical um, composition of it, it's less likely to cause a hangover. Uenosan, do you want to jump in here? <laughs> and also, also, you know, it's a good point. You know, as she, she, she made a really good point. You know, you know, she said though, SK2 lotion, SK2 lotion. Yes. Did you know S stand for sake, K stand for koji? I did not know that. Ah, sake kasu. Sorry, sake kasu. Sorry. So, you know, this is how they found out, you know, the, the people who work in the sake brewery has a really nice skin, especially in the hand, because they, you know, they mix the rice uh, hand with, a, uh, you know, use a hand to mix the koji rice and other things. So their hands and skins are so white and very moist and soft. So they found out and she says, oh, made a, you know, not like now, SK2 is one of the, the best lotion you can buy in the world. And if everybody in here in the United States and Europe, people are talking about SK2, but SK2 stands for sake kasu. Oh my gosh, awesome. Yeah, I am, I am a customer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So another thing is, you know, keep it keeps you warm. You know, sake, uh, when you are drinking sake warm, uh, keeps you warm longer than other alcohol drink. As there is a, you know, study done by this, you know, uh, other drinks goes down after like this, but sake, uh, your body temperature stays and gradually goes down. So that's another thing uh, that sake is different. And uh, also, uh, that's the uh, reason why many small people drink them to make uh, their body warm and make them, you know, because of the, the, there's so much uh, stress to their body, right? Because they are kind of overweight. But, you know, when they drink sake, they become more uh, warm and your uh, bang, blood bang, become bigger. And those effects, uh, sake has more than other drink and it doesn't get you cold. The temperature doesn't go, go down quickly, so it's good for your body. Perfect. Yeah, um, just to kind of go back to that hangover thing. Um, so basically sake doesn't have sulfites and you usually find a bunch of sulfites in wine. So if that's something you worry about, um, I would definitely switch to sake. Uh, something else our instructor Sarah Guderbach likes to say is that it's a lot better for your teeth as well. It won't stain your teeth. <laughs> um, also, it's got about the one third acidity of wine and very low histamines. And those are all things that kind of help produce a hangover. So if you switch to sake. Yeah, I was tasting, you know, two days ago, I was, just, uh, I was doing a wine tasting at the San Francisco International Wine Challenge and I, I start coughing after, you know, white wine because, you know, there's a sulfites. And I, I, I you know, we, we, we tasted that day 144. And I start, you know, my throat was kind of itchy. And that was coming from sulfites. So many wine drinker is changed to sake because of that, because it doesn't have a sulfite. So, you, you know, you, you don't want to get, you know, that itchy feeling. And also next day, uh, because of the low acid, after one, having like uh, same amount of wine and sake, wine next day you're gonna have a dry throat because the acid is so high. But sake doesn't do that. That's the big uh, good uh, the better points for that. And sake, most of the sake are vegan. Uh, it doesn't use any egg uh, uh, egg shell or any. Uh, animal proteins to uh, settle and you know find 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 the uh, uh, mush find the uh, liquid. So uh, sake most of the sake I would say most of the U.S. Uh, the the sake in U.S. I would say ninety percent of them are vegans. So that's a good thing. Wow! Right? Yeah, thank you. And there you have it, folks. All the reasons to keep sake as your number one drink of choice. Yeah, and also, um, you know, when you have a, you know, you don't want to have a red tea, black tea when you're having a, you know, party and stuff. And especially ladies, you know, you know, you have to be careful having a black tea, you know, when you're tasting a red wine. Uh, after like three glasses of wine, you get the tea black, but sake doesn't do it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us, Ida and, and Uwano-san. Um, I'd like to introduce Tom Ikeda, Densho's 
uh, executive director to talk a little bit about the Gen Show dinner that's coming up next weekend. Great. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Ida and Toshio. I mean, what an informative session. I had so much fun just listening uh, to all the information. Uh, I, I love how you guys ended up um, how sake can be a healthy thing to do. I think that, that was perfect. As, as if, Danielle, you need an excuse to, to drink more sake, right? Um, yeah, when I, when I looked at who's here, we had over 50 people. And I looked at the list. You know, most of the people um, attending this webinar are supporters of Densho. Most of you are signed up for our um, Densho Dinner at Home event on the 24th. Uh, many of you are, are donors. And, and some of you are virtual ambassadors who have been going out and encouraging others to, to um, attend the event. And so I, I want to give you guys a, just a really short preview. Um, and the, the words that came to mind are best ever. You know, I've, I've been doing this event for you know, almost you know, 20 years. And when I think about the, the program, you know, who the speakers are, because we went virtual, we can actually, we drew from a national uh, pool of, of potential speakers. So in particular, our keynote speakers, whom I've you know, talked with a couple of times, they're, they're gonna be fabulous. And so I really think you know, our dinner program is gonna be you know, one of the best ever. The other thing that's best ever is our attendance. We have more people registered than we've ever had um, attending one of our events. So this is gonna be our largest event. And so that's best ever. And, and another important thing for, I think all of us is, this will be our best ever fundraiser. Um, you know, people have been incredibly generous before the event, and um, and yes, we can do better, but but already uh, we're going to be a best ever. And so I just want to you know, end this by again saying thank you so much to all the people to our to our uh, webinar uh, leaders uh, Danielle for hosting this. And so I'm going to end. You know, I've I've been I've been sipping quite a bit of um you know this one <laughs> yeah and tosho you're you're right this is a dangerous one i mean once i start sipping you can just keep sipping and sipping and you won't even notice it uh so i I've, I've been doing this this is the june my daiginjo and uh so i have my my, my, my little cup and so i just want to say come pie to all of you and again thank you so much <clears throat> and so <laughs> with that Thank you, and uh, I think um, the uh, webinar is over. So uh, for those of you still registering people, you know, thank you, and please keep doing that. So take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.